Hey everybody, welcome back to Catholic NYC Presents. I'm Colin Acaza. Uh, before anything else, please join me in a prayer in the name of the Father and the Son and the Holy Spirit. Amen. Hail Mary, full of grace, the Lord is with thee. Blessed art thou among women, and blessed is the fruit of thy womb, Jesus. Holy Mary, Mother of God, pray for us sinners, now and at the hour of our death. Amen. In the name of the Father, and of the Son, and of the Holy Spirit. Amen. And before we invite our speaker to be on, I wanted to take this opportunity to read the CORL statement on the death of George Floyd. And this is the statement as follows. The book of Ecclesiastes teaches us there is a time to be silent and a time to speak out. We of different faiths cannot remain silent after we watch the shattering video of a police officer keeping his knee on the neck of George Floyd, who is crying out, I can't breathe. Such inhumane treatment of another human being requires a collective response from all people of conscience. The pursuit of justice is a fundamental tenet of our respective religious traditions. And thus we stand together to declare that all life is sacred and all people are equal before the law in a democratic society. We respect those who want to honor George Floyd's memory with peaceful protest against the horror, evil, and the sin that is racism. We also support the members of Floyd's family who said in part, we cannot endanger each other as we respond to the necessary urge to raise our voices in unison and in outrage. Looting and violence distract from the strength of our collective voice. And that was a statement from Floyd's family. We often speak of the thoughts and prayers. We will offer our many prayers of healing, but we need to not only serious thoughts, but also firm action as we work together with all members of our community to find the critical cure of human hatred. Colonel Timothy Dolan is the chair, Reverend Dr. A.R. Bernard Sr. is the president, and Rabbi Joseph Pasanik, vice president, and all the members of the C-O-R-L. And so that was the statement, uh, and we just keep George Floyd, the repose of his soul in prayer, his family in prayer, and we just also pray for just peace and unity in our country. And we are very happy to have back on the show a very good program, or for, I'm sorry, a very good friend of the program, Dr. Greg Batoro. Dr. Greg, good to see you. Hey, so great to be here with you. It is a very good program, so it's, uh, it's good to be here. <laughs> uh, thanks for being back on. And yeah, I'll just let you take it from here to share anything you'd like to do with our young adults this evening. Yeah, you know, I think um, it's what a charged time. You know, what, what a crazy time to be here. And, um, you know, we have so much going on in our world and it's like, really, can we, can we handle any more, you know, like, like just, just when we thought we were kind of, af you know, getting past the, the real, you know, the real storm and, you know, we're, we're, we're seeing these dates popping up on the calendar now for coming out of quarantine and coming back to normal life. And we're sort of making plans and it's like, what phase are we in? And, you know, we're sort of like eking out little by little and, and, you know, then, then this happens, you know, and it's like, kind of like the, you know, the, the powder from the keg getting lit and then just like this explosion and now we see this violence and these protests and this, you know, this, this um, enraged uproar of people like lashing out against, against uh, racism and injustice and, and, and uh, you know, acts of violence against the dignity of the human person and, and it's, you know, against George Floyd. And here we have, you know, I think, a real perfect storm of elements coming together. And so what I want to, what I want to do is maybe share a little bit of insight into where we've come from, what we're going through and where we can go, because this is, we have to make sense of this. Like we have to be able to take a step back and say like, what is going on? And without it being sort of like driven by the news media. So it's like, not CNN, not Fox News, not like XYZ, whatever news outlet deciding like this is going to be the way we spin this. Like, let's all take a step back. And, you know, like I'm not trying to drive traffic to my channel and I don't need to have, you know, a certain perspective. Like this is just taking a step back 
and trying to sort of see things from a reasonable perspective and bringing together, uh, you know, psychology, sociology um, with our faith and, and understanding sort of the bigger picture here. You know, but, but first of all, let, let me start with a quote from John Paul II that I love. And you might have seen this today or before, but John Paul II said, the dignity of the human person is a transcendent value, always recognized as such by those who sincerely search for the truth. Indeed, the whole of human history should be interpreted in the light of this certainty. Every person created in the image and likeness of God is therefore radically oriented towards the creator and is constantly in relationship with those possessed of the same dignity. To promote the good of the individual is thus to serve the common good, which is that point where rights and duties converge and reinforce one another. And I think I think we can see human history in light of this lens, looking through this lens to see human history, these major movements of human rights, civil rights. You know, we look at World War II, we look at, you know, uh, Nazism, we look at women's suffrage, you know, like we look at the, the battle with religion and state we look at back to the French Revolution, we can like continue to go back into history. And we discover that at the center of every major and radical moment is this truth of the dignity of the individual human person. And we've lost any kind of reverence as a culture for the dignity of the human person and as a culture. And obviously we have these like little rights groups that pop up and these little movements and we have the pro-life movement, which is what I think is like the most radical need for protection of the dignity of human life. But even looking again at, you know, to, to fight against racism, which is obviously what we're talking about today, it's the same fight. And there's different groups, different people at different times in, in history when maybe it's women's rights, you know, maybe it's, it's uh, an, an ethnic group or, or the pre-born. But a human person is the human person is the human person. And each individual human person represents an image of God in this world. So what I think is so fascinating is that just three months ago, two months ago, we were talking about the opportunity that is presented because of coronavirus and the pandemic and the quarantine that we were sort of brought into. And I was saying two months ago, thank God for the quarantine and not thank God for coronavirus, but I mean, we can see that too. Thank God for, for everything that happens in God's will and by design. But you know, Corona, obviously there's death and, and a lot of sickness. And, you know, I worked with, I, I know patients that, or I know uh, uh, doctors who are working with patients on the front lines and like, it's scary stuff, especially in New York city. It was like more scary than most places, but the quarantine and the whole world being affected by this crazy time offered an opportunity. And the opportunity was to shake things up and really dismember or dislodge our, our attachments and our patterns and our routines and our expectations. And really, I was saying this because, you know, I teach Catholic mindfulness and, and mindfulness in this Catholic perspective is all about coming back to the present moment to understand what's actually really important right now. If God loves us, if he's the father who keeps us safe, what is in our life happening right now? And it could be like any time of 2019 before we knew about coronavirus and before we knew about George Floyd and everything else. But like it could be just a normal day on a, you know, a, a humdrum, you know, November day. But like that moment of our life 
was the most important thing at that moment, but we're, we're stuck in a routine. So we lose sight of what's most important. And in those moments in November of 2019 that we never thought about racism was happening and, and, and women's uh, rights were being neglected and violence was happening. Domestic violence was occurring and sexual trauma and abuse was happening. And, and thousands of preborn babies were being killed. And like all these things are happening. And most of us were just like, do, 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 do back. You know, this is my normal day. I'm headed on the train. I'm going to work. Like, just like nothing matters except like whatever ruminations are going. I wonder if I'll make the next train. And meanwhile, radical racism was happening and radical abortion and death was happening. And these things that are so important to talk about were happening. And God's heart bleeds and is, is in an in incredible infinite sorrow for the evil of this world. And we are just blind to it. And we just carry on. So when, when the quarantine happened, and then all of a sudden it was like, everything comes to a screeching halt. And, and what I was saying two months ago is like, this is an opportunity to embrace, to let your routines be thwarted. Let your patterns be disrupted. Let your life be turned upside down because it is time for a reckoning for all of us to come to terms with the reality of the evils in this world that we are complacent to that we don't care and we just let it go because it's not affecting whether or not I'm stressed about making my next train or whether I'm going to get this job pr uh, promotion or whether you know th this conversation went the right way or if I'm going to get in a fight or if I'm dating or if I'm not dating or if whatever. So we went into quarantine. Life is turned upside down. We have to take a moment. And now what happens? People are like, oh, this is amazing. I love working from home. I don't need to get back into traffic. I, maybe I don't ever have to go back to the office. You know, and then people are like, wow, I love having all this extra time with my family. I've got friends who live in Connecticut who take the train into the city and they spend like three hours a day commuting uh, normally. And now they're like, that's three extra hours I'm spending with my wife and my kids. Like, it's going to be pretty tough to get them to give that up at the end of this quarantine, right? So like life is changing in people's minds and the importance and the value and the beauty of life is starting to become a little bit more obvious. And what's right and what's wrong is starting to become a little bit more obvious. And if I took a step back and really think about what's happening in this moment right now, because this issue has come to the surface and we've been reminded of this radical violent racism that is a very real part of our country and our history and our present it's cre like we have this totally different response to it right now and it's it's amazing to see and i'm i'm like proud of humanity now i'm not talking about the looting and the violence i've of course i'm not proud of that but it seems like the response in like social media and the blogs and the podcasts and like all the influencers, it's like, this is really different. This is, this is like a way more intense response than like Ferguson when that happened. And like these things have been escalating and people are like, well, it's kind of like the boiling pot or, or that, you know, things are simmering and the pressure cooker is starting to explode. I think there's another layer to it. And what I think we can do is see the good in this, that we have been changed by the quarantine so that we are going to, I pray to God, see with different eyes when these gro gross and grave injustices are occurring, that we will not stand, we will not be silent, and that we will not stand for these kinds of injustices to to just go on as if it's like no big deal. It's just another part of the news cycle. I've been, I've been myself like really a little bit uh, sort of confused about 
not confused, but like uncertain about like exactly how to approach what's been happening. And part of my response has been to sort of like, you know, back away from it a little bit, but it warrants, it's, it's doing something in me and it's warranting something in all of us that we all have to kind of decide what we're going to do about this. But we, in each in our individual ways, according to our individual reach, like whether it's just educating ourselves or, you know, reaching out to people that might be sort of disregarded or, uh, you know, looked down upon or, or whatever. But the fact is what I hope and pray is that our perception has changed as a race, as a human race, that we can all in this unity of our humanity, start to see more clearly the dignity of the human person. And that whatever we needed to go through from the quarantine, maybe shifted stuff for us just enough, our perspective, so that we can start to take a stand against injustice when it happens more and more. And so this may be like just the first thing that happened to catch the news cycle as we're coming out of this quarantine. And, and I, I hope and pray that our response to injustice doesn't decrease as we move forward and that we continue to take these things very seriously. And I would say that the ongoing daily slaughter of unborn children, maybe we take another look at that, you know, as a culture, not just like pockets in the church, but like maybe the culture takes another look at that. Maybe, just maybe, some mindsets and some paradigms have been shifted or broken apart enough in the moment so that we can take another look at things like that. And, and hopefully we can start to connect the dots and realize that this is not a George Floyd issue alone. It is a George Floyd issue. And we cannot forget that because his individual human dignity can't be sort of grouped together now. And it's like, oh, it's a movement and we lose sight of the person because the individual is what it's all about. He is what it's all about. That's what this moment is all about. But the reason why I kind of paused on even having my own response to it publicly is like, this is what the news cycle does. You know, it's like they drum up of tension. It's this one thing. And then like next week, next month, it's forgotten about. And George Floyd gets forgotten about. So like we need it to be more than that. And we need it to be something that changes us. So that's what I hope and pray is happening. I hope that, you know, socially, sociologically, psychologically, we've all had to like go through this shift as things have been like the rug has been pulled out from underneath us as we've all had to sort of like pause our lives and really sort of reevaluate what's most important. And then now as we participate in culture and society and community, and as these things start to happen around us, maybe we'll have a different take on it. So that's kind of like my hopeful look at this and, you know, pray for, uh, you know, pray for every, all parties involved. I mean, this is just, I don't even know where to start. And, and with, with the actual issue of racism and in our culture and things like that. But I just, yeah, I hope on a bit on a, a from the bigger picture on a, on a sort of a bigger scale, we need to be shaken out of our complacency. And, and we need to realize that like, this is this the way the world is is not okay when the dignity of the each individual human person is so grossly disregarded and so you know pray for god's mercy to come upon us to to fill our hearts to transform to break us and transform us and that we can start to actually be conduits and 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 beacons of light of his love and that we can actually share together and what humanity is supposed to be all about so that's, that's the best that I've been able to make sense of all this so far. And it's all, it's all happening very quickly, but that's, that's kind of where I'm at and what I've been looking at. Greg, thanks for the thoughts. You know, one issue that's just even getting more and more in depth right now is the issue of fear. You know, first it was like the fearing of, of, the, of the virus and then the quarantine. And then just, just I just see it in my family members. I see people calling me people concerned with the stuff that's happening now in the in various cities, especially here in New York City, which young adults who are watching this program are some of them right in the heart of Manhattan. How, and I remember your talk from last time, which was so great. 
what, what do you, how do you, how can we bring the, the remembrance of the father's love in all of this and how to deal with the fear that we're now experiencing in this next, in this next stage here of fear that we're facing because of the, of the rioting? Yeah, it's a great question. I mean, our response has to be a virtuous outrage. And, and we have to have, we have to unite. Somebody asked here, I see in the comments, Father Carlos asked about this, you know, this division between this false dichotomy that's being built between like, you're either on like the social justice side and you're defending, you know, the, the sort of protest of racism, or you're on the side that you're, you know, against the looting and, and all this craziness that's happening with the violence. And like, it's a false dichotomy. You know, we have to, it's, we have to have both. Like we need to be against violence and against destruction. We have to be for outrage and for anger for and against injustice. Like Christ flipped over the tables in the temple. But there's balance. Like he didn't burn down the temple. So we need to we need to like have reason and and virtue in this process. It's not that the anger is wrong. It's not that the outrage is wrong. But we also have to be able to see it with God's eyes and 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 find the ways to be very serious about our protest and very serious about our outrage, but not in a way that that perpetuates destruction, especially when it perpetuates destruction of other dignities of other human persons. It's such a slap in the face of the deepest evil of what actually happened. If, if, if we can't transform the culture from the bottom up, then we are wasting our time, wasting our voice and wasting our the destruction of property. It has to be a restoration of the recognition of the dignity of the human person. And that is a cross the board without any any looking at color or gender or or race or age or any of these types of things so if, if we don't have that fundamental union of dignity and human person then everything is up for grabs it's all up for interpretation so we have to come back to that and and to to put this in line with again with the mercy of god the foundation for the dignity of the human person is that we're made in his image. This is the only way through this. This is the only way out. There will be no sociological answer that works if it disregards the purpose of our, of, of our calling, that we're made in the image of God, that we're made for a purpose beyond this world, that we're made with the dignity to be in union with him for eternity. And every single individual person, like if you meet George on the street, it's like you brother in Christ are made for union with God. I like the angels would be tempted to worship George Floyd and his being in the image of God. That's where the outrage comes from. How could you step on his neck and kill a man like that? That is that is like the the it's it's the worst kind of travesty because it's the image of God in this world being literally trampled. But it, it can't just be about race. It's about yes, it's about race, but it's about so much more than race. And if we keep it confined to this one little pocket where it's just about race, that's today. Then tomorrow it's going to be about you know, uh, you know, gender or, or age or any of these other issues that come up. And, 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 and so we have to put it, everything in position in context that we have a father who created us, each single human person in his image. And therefore we have this infinite dignity and value. The very fact that we exist is enough to earn that value of, of infinite dignity. And that has to restore and reorder the way that we see each other. And how would you recommend to people to deal with the fear that they're experiencing right now with all that's going on? 
I mean, there's two levels here. So we have like the practical fear, which is like if people are throwing bottles outside of your door, like don't go outside. So like there's a healthy fear in that. And then there's also like this other fear, which is what I've been speaking against since the beginning of the quarantine, which is like the world is going upside down and, you know, we're all going to die from coronavirus and like, where is God in all of this? And, you know, there's that, what I would call unhealthy fear, which is detached from stability and being planted, rooted in God. God is our father who loves us. He's infinitely powerful. He's infinitely loving and he's infinitely knowing in a personal way. So when I talk through people with like anxiety or fear, now some anxiety is diagnosable and physiological. So I'm not talking about that, but like all of us have normal moments of anxiety. And to work through that, I say like, well, which heresy do you believe? Cause you're a heretic. So do you believe the heresy that God is not all powerful? Do you believe the heresy that God is not all loving? Or do you believe the heresy that God does not know you personally and that he's all knowing? Because if you are afraid of anything, you clearly believe one of those three things, or maybe all three, but it could be one or, 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 or all. If you really dig into that, like, do I know that God loves me personally? And that's where most people actually fall short. It's like, if we've not been loved perfectly in our own lives and we haven't been formed in an atmosphere of like recognizing our own value and dignity, then it's pretty hard to like, just sort of like learn in a textbook or in a Bible or from a Sunday homily, God loves you. You know, it's not, it's not like you hear God loves you. And then all of a sudden you're like, Oh, well then I feel wonderful. Everything is great. Like, that's not typically the way it works. I wouldn't really have a job if it worked so easily. But that's one disconnect. Another one is like, well, I know he loves me and I know he knows me, but he doesn't really keep in control of everything. So we actually might still be in a lot of danger. Or you might say that he's got total control and yes, he loves you, but he's not interested in like the daily ins and outs of your life. He's not paying that much attention where he knows like exactly what's happening today. You know, so those are people who think of God as being sort of like far and distant from the world. If any one of those things are not in place, then we have a lot of reason to be afraid. And like people, people talk about my, um, I teach Catholic mindfulness, like I mentioned. And by the way, if anybody's interested in any of the stuff that I, that I do, you can go to catholicpsych.com if you go to catholicpsych.com slash store, we have like a page with a bunch of free resources and some courses and a virtual retreat and stuff like that. But um, when I teach this Catholic mindfulness, people are like, you know, like, are you trying to like, you know, shortcut prayer? Are you trying to like give people a remedy to their anxiety without including God and all this stuff? And I'm like, this is ridiculous because like my audience is Catholic. So I'm already presuming that the people who want to talk to me, Dr. Greg Bataro, Catholic psychologist from the Catholic Psych Institute are Catholic. But it finally struck me. I was talking to somebody who was not Catholic and they were telling me that they don't really have that grounding in a father who loves them. And they were like, well, what do you mean by abandonment to divine providence? I've never even heard of that. What does that mean? And they're like, abandonment, surrender. Like, what are you? That's like against the grain of like everything reasonable from being a human person. And I took a step back and I was like, you know, that's kind of true. Like, unless you have the revelation of Jesus Christ, like, why would you just abandon yourself? Like, that's kind of contradictory to everything in us, like our survival instinct. So then I realized. If you don't have a relationship with God, if you don't know that God is trustworthy, that he loves you, and that he's all-knowing and all-powerful, maybe you should be afraid. Like, people are like, well, I, you know, is mindfulness going to help me sleep at night? And I'm like, well, I don't know. Do you believe in God? 
Because if you don't believe in God, maybe you shouldn't be sleeping at night. Like that's kind of a scary world to live in where coronavirus can come and people can like, you know, burn down your building and people die and people get sick and people suffer. And there's all sorts of crazy racism and all sorts of other kind of prejudice in this world. Like this is a scary place to live. If we don't have context to make sense of that, maybe we should be afraid. That's not psychologically unhealthy. I would say that that's a pretty psychologically healthy response to a very scary situation. So, you know, there's something called inappropriate or appropriate affect. You know, it's like when we're doing like a, uh, an assessment of somebody in the hospital, it's like, does this person have appropriate affect? And if they come in and they say like, oh, I was just in a car accident and they're laughing hysterically about it. That's inappropriate affect. Well, if you're living in this world and don't understand God and you're scared, I would say that that's appropriate affect. Now, what's inappropriate affect is when we know God, we believe in God, we've, we've been given the revelation of Jesus Christ, we have the gift of faith, we have the Holy Spirit, we frequent the sacraments, and we believe, we, we proclaim our creed that we have this belief in God who is all powerful, all knowing and all loving. And then we're scared. How does that line up? So this is where we need to connect the dots between what we believe our framework up here and sort of what we're expecting of ourselves and the choices that we're making about how we live our life. And again, some of this is a process. Some of it means we're, we're fighting against physiological components. The brain is not something you can just switch on and off the different switches of your, your, your uh, endocrine system, your hormones, when cortisol and adrenaline are pushing through your body, things like that. Like you can't just turn that off immediately, but we can make choices that move us in the direction of having greater peace by connecting the dots between our emotional life and our faith. And that's where our full human freedom comes on display. We have the freedom to make a choice. First, we have to realize it. First, we have to be called out of our complacency. And then we have to be given the choice and realize, no, you actually have the freedom to make a choice. You don't have to be afraid today. You don't have to be worried about what's going to happen next week or next month or next year. You can actually make a choice to abandon yourself to divine providence and to surrender yourself with trusting abandon into the arms of the father, because we believe him. We believe Jesus. He said, all will be well. We can believe him. And so little by little, not immediately, but little by little, we can put into practice certain things that will help us to actually live that way. And, and this is what can transform everything. We had another question here. How do we reconcile our beliefs in the dignity of all human beings with the reality we may have experienced or witnessed racism in the church? What is the path to healing and change individually and or as an institution? Yeah, it's a great question. I mean, the racists are human and they have dignity as a human person. We cannot forget that. So there's not... I don't know if there's something to reconcile there necessarily, but in terms of like what to do is a great question. And this is what I work with people on almost every day is when has injustice occurred in your life? Even if it means like your own family of origin. So maybe it's like very, if you look at your sort of internal system of even your position in your own family, there might be ways that you've suffered injustice in your own family. And then there's ways that you might suffer injustice in a bigger community where even if it's not directed at you, you're a witness to injustice that's occurring to somebody else where the dignity of a human person is being disregarded. And that could be violent. It could be very subtle. It could be sexism. It could be racism. You know, it could be like people talking badly about somebody based on some of these, you know, external factors that are stripping them of their dignity as a human person. So at the end of the day, it's the same thing. It's, it's the same answer. We have 
to have the courage to speak up. And people are like, well, I don't want to say something about this priest. I don't want to say something about mom. I don't want to say something bad about dad. I don't want to say something bad about my boss. I don't want to, you know, I don't want to get in trouble. I don't want to face criticism. I don't want to, you know, I was thinking about it. It was like, and this was really hard self reflection. Cause I was like, if I was on the street, when I saw this happening, what would I do? And now, now that I have in retrospect and hindsight, like I'd like to play that out in my mind. And I'd like to think that I would do like, like some kind of running elbow, like tackle the cop and like get him off the guy's neck. If I saw this happening in front of me, I don't know. I, I wish I could say that. Like, I, I, I can't, I can't say that with hundred percent certainty. Cause I wasn't there. I'm not there. Like, that's not the situation I'm in. You'd like to think in hindsight, you know, uh, you know, tw- you see things 2020 and you think the best of ourselves, but there's a lot of fear in that. You know, if I was standing on that street and I was watching those things happen and like, if I wouldn't do it, if I'm not even sure that I would do that, watching a cop, you're supposed to like trust the cops. So it's like, they, they must know what they're doing. This might be some situation. I don't want to get arrested. I don't want to get killed. Like if I attack a cop, I'm pretty much sure that I, I could be shot. So if I wouldn't do it in a life and death situation, how do I know that I'm going to have the courage to do it when somebody's like not given a job, disregarded for some promotion, disregarded for some, you know, recognition, some minor thing? Like how easy is it to walk away from that thing? So I'm saying this not as somebody that's like, Oh, this is the answer. And this is what everybody should do. And of course, like, this is like, I'm saying that with fear and trepidation, like this is scary stuff. And, and I know that I've like confronted things in my own family. I've helped patients confront things in their family. I've like walked the walk with people. It's scary. It's scary as hell to face the repercussions of having a voice. But again, I hope and pray to God that the reorientation of our perspective with the quarantine plus the extreme consequences of this thing carried out to its mortal end, seeing this literally in a life and death situation is making all of us like really take this very seriously to be like, how am I afraid of the repercussions that come from speaking out against injustice and against uh, you know, people acting against the dignity of the human person. And so that's, that's the best that I can say is the path to healing and change. That's where we have to start is working on ourselves individually. And then whatever is appropriate in whatever community organization group that you're in, like you start in yourself, take it to the next person, take it to a few more people and then, and then go, you know, go wider and bigger as, as uh, is appropriate given the context. And we got to remember, I mean, Jesus, why was he killed? For things he was saying, you know? So, Dr. Greg, I can't thank you enough for your time. Uh, can, can you just remind us again how to get in touch with you, with the Psych Institute, with the, with the Catholic Mindfulness Retreats you do? Yeah, catholicpsych.com slash store. You'll find my retreats. You'll find some free stuff on there, exercises. And, uh, and then we have a full team of, of therapists. We work with people online. Um, you know, around the world with online therapy. So there's a contact form there. If you're interested in, you know, needing to talk some of the stuff out, if you want to process some of the things you've been through, or if you've been, uh, you know, privy to some of these things that have been going on around you and you need to like work that through, you know, we have a full team of people that are, are helping people, you know, walk this walk. Thank you. And I just want to remind everybody again, that um, just this, I, I know there's a lot of fear out there. I'm feeling it myself. I know, especially those uh, in New York and in the various cities around the country right now, but just encourage you to stay in the refuge of the Immaculate Heart of Mary. Our Lady in Fatima talks about this and promises her protection. She, there's a great correlation between the rosary and peace. She brings this numerous times in various apparitions throughout history. So I just really again encourage you to pray for the peace of the world, of this country, for unity of the world. In this country, there is real 
power in the rosary. There is real power in fasting. So I know there may be not much you feel like you can do still in a sense, especially in New York. I mean, the stay at home is the stay at home order is still June 13th. So in the sense, there's not a lot we can do and you might feel helpless, but there's so much you can do in prayer and fasting. And especially when the church is open back up to really diving in and really participating at a new and much greater level in the sacraments. Because the reality of everything that Greg was talking about, the real answer to all of this, because is the, is we have a heart problem. There's an inner world problem. And the only thing that's going to solve that and heal that is Jesus Christ, who is love and mercy himself and is love. And the only way we have access to that love is, is by, the, by re receiving the prayer and, and participating in that prayer. You know, one of my favorite, pro my, my favorite quotes um, is, the, is from God. He's like, be the change you want to see in the world. And we've got to, we got to take that seriously. We got to take that seriously within our, in our hearts. And that comes through a relationship with Jesus Christ to receive that love so we can give that love. Uh, so we just, again, thank you, Dr. Greg Vittorio, for uh, sharing your thoughts with us. I encourage everybody out there to look at his stuff. I've been going through the Catholic mindfulness retreats myself. They are extremely powerful. Uh, and I can promise you and guarantee you there's not one of you out there who wouldn't need it. We all need it. We all need a better relationship with the Father. We all got to understand more than just the spirituality of it, but also the psychological things that are happening within the human person. And Greg does a phenomenal job of bringing those two together. Uh, so we thank you, Greg. And guys, thank you. And let's just end with the Hail Mary, especially for George Floyd and his family and for all that's been going on in the name of the Father and the Son and the Holy Spirit. Amen. Hail Mary, full of grace, the Lord is with thee. Blessed art thou among women and blessed is the fruit of thy womb, Jesus. Holy Mary, Holy Mary Mother, of, Mother God. of God, pray Holy for us Lord. sinners now and at the God hour of God. our death. Amen. In the name of the Father, and the Son, and the Holy Spirit. Amen. Uh, tune in for tomorrow night. We'll have our virtual young adult mass, and we hope to see you there. God bless you all.